Since people first walked on this planet, they've been fascinated by the various objects they saw in the heavens. At first it seemed that the sun, the moon and the stars govern their lives in some way. When it became clear that the heavenly bodies were not gods but actual things out there in space, the search was on for a mechanism. What were these objects we could see? How did it all work? And above all, how far away were these things we could see in the sky? This story is about how we came to grasp the basics of our own solar system without ever having to leave the Earth to do it. Our story hinges around a bright object seen from time to time close to the sun and near the horizon. It's sometimes mistaken for a UFO. It's sometimes called the morning star, except of course when it appears in the evening when people, not surprisingly, call it the evening star. It's exerted a strange fascination for many people at different times, all chasing after the great secret that it held. The thousands of stars in the sky were long ago seen as patterns or constellations and while these patterns moved across the sky over the year, the same shapes were always there. Except for five stars that just didn't obey the same rules. They moved around relative to the others, and they seemed to do very strange things. For thousands of years, they remained a puzzle. Five wandering stars out of so many fixed ones. Now, of course, we know they aren't stars at all, but planets. The word planet actually means wanderer. Our wandering friend up there is actually the planet Venus, and it was this planet that finally unlocked some important secrets about our solar system. Does the Earth move? It doesn't seem to when you're standing on it, so for a long time people thought that the Earth was fixed, and the stars, sun and planets orbited around it. To explain how the planets could move in such strange ways, sometimes forwards, then backwards, call for some weird and wonderful explanations. But by 1530, Nicholas Copernicus had come to the conclusion that the Earth and the planets all went around the Sun. After hundreds of years of barking up the wrong tree, astronomy moved forward into the modern age. This wonderful model shows the major planets orbiting the Sun. The relative speed of everything is accurate, although of course it runs much faster than the real solar system. The planets nearer the Sun go round faster than the outer ones. This planet nearest the Sun is Mercury. The next one is the subject of our story, the planet Venus, which goes round the Sun once every 225 days. The next planet, with its single moon, takes exactly a year to orbit the Sun. It's our own Earth. Then, continuing to move further out, we find Mars. Jupiter with its moons. Then Saturn. As the various planets all go round at different speeds, the inner ones overtake the outer ones, and the planets move in relation to the background of the fixed stars, which are much, much further away. That's why they appear to us to wander about in the sky. So by the 16th century, people knew how the planets moved, how the solar system worked. But what they really wanted to know was how far away they were, and especially how far away was the sun. The extraordinary story of the search for these answers hinged on the behavior of one of the planets, and that planet was Venus, the morning star. Now, because Venus orbits the Sun more quickly than the Earth, it has this special property that every 19 months it overtakes the Earth on the inside lane, as it were. This overtaking is the key to working out how far not only Venus, but all the planets actually are from the Sun. Imagine that this ball floating on the surface of a lake represents the Sun, 
and a duck swimming around the ball plays the part of the earth. Venus is represented by a flying fish that also swims around the ball more quickly than the duck and nearer to the ball. The flying fish swims at an angle so that sometimes it's above the water and sometimes below it. Just once in a while something special happens. The orbits coincide and all three objects are briefly in a straight line. Seen from the duck's point of view, this is the only moment when the fish passes in front of the ball. This rare event, when the planet Venus passes across the face of the Sun, is called a transit of Venus. This transit turned out to be crucial to finding the size of the solar system. But first, they had to observe it. In 1632, the records of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, show a new student arriving at the university. His name was Jeremiah Horrocks. He came from Toxteth in Liverpool, very much the poor local boy made good. We don't know how well he did at his studies, but we do know that he studied astronomical tables like this in his spare time. Astronomy wasn't taught at Cambridge in those days, so everything that Horrocks learned he had to teach himself. At the age of only 21, he moved to Houle, near Preston. He needed to earn a living, and Horrocks was probably the tutor to the children of the Stones family, local gentry, who lived here at Carr House. In what free time he had, he pursued his astronomy. So what sort of person was Jeremiah Horrocks? Well, from the few letters that remain, it's obvious he was a young man in a hurry, a bit impatient and very ambitious. And it was during his time working here at Hall, he was only here for just over a year, that the event occurred that was to make his name. And ironically, he nearly missed it. This is one of the instruments Jeremiah Horrocks would have used, the astronomical radius. It enables you to measure the relative positions of the stars and planets. And it works by sandwiching the two objects between these two sliders here, and then just reading off the angle between them. This didn't give the distances of things, but told you the angle between two objects. So you could plot the position of one object in relation to another. One of the things Jeremiah Horrocks was studying was the position of the planet Venus. Kepler was the first person to work out that such a thing as a transit of Venus could actually happen. In 1627, he predicted that there would be one four years later, in 1631. Unfortunately, Kepler died before it happened, and no one saw it. Kepler reckoned it would be more than a hundred years before the Sun, Venus, and the Earth lined up for another transit. So that appeared to be that. Horrocks used his homemade instrument to plot the position of Venus as it gradually moved against the background of fixed stars. We can only guess at how many nighttime hours he spent observing and measuring. But we do know that out of all these meticulous observations, he suddenly made a very exciting and unexpected discovery. He realized that the transits of Venus across the face of the Sun happened in pairs, eight years apart, and only then was there a gap of over a hundred years. Kepler had been right about the previous transit in 1631. The reason no one had seen it was simple. For observers in Europe, it had happened at night, when the sun wasn't visible. 
Horrocks realized there was going to be a second chance to observe this rare phenomenon that no one had ever seen, and that if he managed to see it, it would be an enormous scientific triumph. The trouble was, when he realized what was going to happen, it was late October 1639, and the predicted transit was less than four weeks away. Horrocks had very little time in which to get ready for the most important day of his life. Though he would never know it, it was a day that would be the start of something big, really big. He owned what he described as a small half a crown telescope, and he quickly got the bits together that would let him observe Venus passing in front of the sun. He was particularly proud of the accuracy of his scale, all done by hand. Horrocks wasn't a famous astronomer, so he couldn't alert the world to what he believed was about to happen. They just wouldn't have taken him seriously. He did write to a friend of his called William Crabtree, who was supposed to pass the word on to an astronomer that he knew, but the message seems to have got lost. Horrocks was on his own. Horrocks used his telescope to project an image of the sun onto a piece of paper so that he could look at the sun safely. Having closed the windows against the light, I directed my telescope towards the sun and I watched carefully and increasingly for any dark body that might enter upon the disk of light. The chance of a cloudy atmosphere caused me much anxiety. Starting at dawn, Jeremiah Horrocks watched and waited, hoping to see the planet Venus pass across the face of the sun. But he watched in vain. Nothing was visible. Also, it was rather a dull old November day, and there was a lot of cloud about. Perhaps he'd missed the transit. Observing during the afternoon was to be even more difficult. November the 24th was a Sunday, so there might have been various duties which he couldn't ignore, instructing the children in their catechism, accompanying the family here to St. Michael's Church. And although he wasn't actually the curate, given his Cambridge education, he might well have had an unpaid role here at the church as Bible clerk, which would have involved reading from the scriptures.
Who hath laid the measures of the earth, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? By the time the service finished, there was barely half an hour before sunset and the last chance to see a transit for the next hundred years. Jeremiah! About 15 minutes past three in the afternoon when I was again at liberty to continue my labours, the clouds, as if by divine interposition, were entirely dispersed and I was once more invited to the grateful task of repeating my observations. laid the measures of the earth, or who hath stretched the line upon it. I then beheld a most agreeable spectacle, a spot of unusual magnitude and of a perfectly circular shape which had already fully entered upon the sun's disk on the left. I immediately applied myself to observe it. So, observing alone in his little room, the self-taught Jeremiah Horrocks was to be the first person not only to observe but also to measure the elusive transit of Venus across the face of the Sun. I was enabled by divine providence to complete so effectually that I could have scarcely have wished for a more extended period. But what Horrocks didn't realise was how important this brief observation done in just half an hour was to become. Since the position of the Sun was known almost exactly, Horrocks could now fix the position of Venus far more accurately than anyone had ever managed before. In so doing, he laid the foundation for the next transit observations more than a hundred years later. He also showed that Venus was not just a light in the sky, a wandering star. It was another world, a planet like our own that appeared dark when viewed against the Sun since it only shone by reflecting the Sun's light. In his writings, Jeremiah Horrocks reveals that he was beginning to think about the big question in astronomy at that time. How to work out the size of the solar system. But it was not to be. Jeremiah Horrocks was a young man of enormous ability, and it is tantalizing to imagine what he might have achieved had he lived longer. But his early promise was not realized. Just a year later, having moved back to Liverpool, he arranged to meet his friend Crabtree. And the day before he was to set out, he died suddenly. He was 22 years old. Horrocks' observations of the transit of Venus were going to be the key to working out the ultimate question. What was the size of the solar system? It was beginning to dawn on astronomers how they could do it. They already had one piece of the jigsaw. Observations of the planets had meant that astronomers knew exactly how long it took each planet to go round the Sun. The further a planet was from the Sun, the longer it took to go round. And back in 1619, Kepler told the world in his famous third law of planetary motion that the relationship was a precise one. The third law stated that the distance of each planet from the Sun was proportional to the time it took that planet to make one revolution around the Sun. So it meant that people knew the relative distance of all the planets from the Sun, but not their absolute distances. In a sense, they had an accurate map, but they didn't know the scale. But it was realized that if the next transit of Venus could be used to determine one distance, that of the Earth from the Sun, then from that figure the exact size of the whole solar system could be worked out. 
How was that to be done? Horrocks, sitting in northern England, saw Venus move across the face of the sun. But imagine the point of view of someone else a long way away, say, the other side of the world. From there, Venus would appear to trace a different line across the face of the sun. What you'd have is a giant problem in geometry, with lines stretching through space. Kepler had worked out the relative distances of Venus and the Earth from the sun, and they would know the exact distance between observers on Earth, so they could work out this distance on the face of the sun. If they knew this, then they could easily work out the actual size of the sun, and from that, at last, they could calculate the sun's distance from the Earth. And from that one known figure, Kepler's law meant that they could immediately work out the dimensions of the whole solar system. So much for the theory. The problem remained of making sufficiently accurate observations, especially from the southern hemisphere. And they had to wait a bit as well. The next transit wouldn't be for more than a hundred years after Horrocks saw it. the transit of 1769, Britain decided that nothing less than an all-out effort would do. It was easy enough to make observations from Europe, but much harder from the other largely unexplored southern hemisphere. It was decided that a major naval expedition would take place. The reason was simple. It wasn't just a case of finding the actual size of the solar system. They saw that advances in astronomy would help navigation. The Royal Society certainly saw the importance of the observation and they applied to George III for money to finance the trip. He awarded them £4,000, which is basically what they'd asked for. For the main expedition to the Southern Hemisphere, they decided to go to Tahiti. It was exactly the other side of the world from Europe and part of the reason for picking it was that the natives were friendly. That only left the question of who should go. The Navy looked for an officer with some experience of astronomy. They found a relatively obscure but competent seaman who had previously carried out observations of a solar eclipse. He also had the navigational skills to get to Tahiti. And so, out of the need to make an astronomical observation from the Southern Hemisphere, was born one of the most famous seafaring voyages ever made. It was the stuff of legends because the obscure but competent seaman the Navy chose was Captain James Cook. His Majesty's bark, the Endeavour, whereof you are commander, is to be fitted out in a proper manner to observe the passage of the planet Venus over the disk of the Sun on the 3rd of June, 1769. The crew had to put up with Cook's mad ideas about Nouvelle Cuisine. Sauerkraut was issued, and they were fed fresh meat and vegetables whenever available. And whatever was issued had to be eaten, captain's orders. But nine months later, in April 1769, they reached Tahiti, with not a single case of scurvy. Quite an achievement for those days. There were seven weeks to spare before the transit, and they waited at the site they had chosen, which they called Fort Venus, hoping for good weather. Tough life. This day proved as favorable to our purpose as we could wish. 
Not a cloud was to be seen the whole day, and the air was perfectly clear, so that we had every advantage we could desire in observing the whole passage of the planet Venus over the sun's disk. The thermometer, exposed to the sun about the middle of the day, rose to a degree of heat we have not before met with. Once they'd seen the transit, Cook proceeded with his other orders to explore the Southern Ocean for further land. He went on to chart the coasts of New Zealand and Australia. Pretty successful trip, really. 138 people observed the transit all over the world. Their observations were collected together and compared, and then they did their sums. They got a range of figures for the distance to the sun, from 88 to 108 million miles. They took the average. And that meant that the distance of all the planets from the sun could now be worked out. So, one outcome of Cook's epic voyage to the southern hemisphere was the charting of the solar system itself. So they'd managed to work out the distance of the five wandering stars, the planets, and all without ever leaving the Earth. The next transit was in 1874, and for the first time, astronomers could actually photograph it. Venus finally yielded all her secrets in 1964. A radar signal bounced from the Earth gave an exact figure for the distance of Venus from the Earth. And from that, they worked out the modern accepted figure of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, which is 93 million miles, or 149 million kilometers. That's only a few percent different from the figure after Cook's epic voyage. There have been few opportunities over the last 350 years to observe the elusive transit of Venus. Jeremiah Horrocks first observed it in 1639, and then Captain Cook, sailing to Tahiti, observed one of the next pair in 1769. There were two in the 1800s, but that's it. There hasn't been one this century. The next one is due in June 2004, and I hope I have a chance to see it, if it isn't cloudy. We put together an astronomy project pack, which will help to get you started if you'd like to find out more about the night sky. If you'd like a pack, please send a cheque or postal order for £9.99 made out to BBC Education to this address. Astronomy Pack, PO Box 7, London, W3, 6XJ.